Hi, my name is DM Barr and I write novels of sex, suspense, and satire. My most recent novel, Saving Grace, a psychological thriller, is available on pre-order at Amazon and other fine book distributors. Uh, if you're looking at me and wondering, you look different, it's because I have a new computer, thanks to my husband who gave it to me on my birthday. And uh, so the camera's a little better and hopefully my color is a little better, though I look kind of blurry to myself. Uh, you can let me know what you think. Uh, today on Author Groupie, my guest is Eric Goodman, who has written his sixth novel, which is a hybrid memoir slash historical novel. And uh, it uh, is quite interesting. He's going to read from it and I think you'll enjoy that. He's also the former uh, head of the creative writing program at Miami University of Ohio. So very interesting guy. Sit back, enjoy, and as always, stay safe. Welcome to another edition of Author Groupie. And um, Cuppy and Stu, The Bombing of Flight 629, a love story marks Dr. Eric Goodman's sixth foray into fiction. Uh, it's part historical novel, part memoir told from the viewpoint of the daughter of a couple who perished on the flight. The book is a novel, but the daughter is the author's wife, Susan, and the deceased couple would have been his in-laws. Eric's first, uh, or his five previous novels include Twelfth and Race, which has been described as a unique discussion about race and identity wrapped up in a, uh, a powerful love story. Child of My Right Hand, the story of a gay adolescent boy's coming of age in a small Midwestern town, and In Days of Awe, the novel, or it's a novel about redemption and being a Jew, particularly a disgraced pitcher, Joe Singer, uh, which is timely as we approach Yom Kippur. For many years, Eric directed the creative writing program at Miami University of Ohio. He lives with his wife in Mecklenburg, New York and Sonoma County, California. Is that all correct? 100% except I'm not a doctor. I apologize. I guess when I heard that you were a, a college professor, I figured, but my mistake. Uh, welcome in any case to Author Groupie. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So tell us about the new book. Is Cuppy and Stu a historical novel, a memoir, or some combination of the two genres? Uh, it's a combination of the two genres. Um, it's inspired by, and, and in many ways, pretty accurate uh, uh, about the bombing of Flight 629. United Flight 629 uh, uh, was bombed uh, by Jack Graham, whose mother was on the plane, uh, in, on November 1st, 1955. Um, and the first half of the, no of the novel is really about my wife's parents, Cuppy and Stu in the title, that, that was what they called each other, uh, Stuart Morgan and Ann Morgan. Cuppy was her nickname, sh shortened from Cupcake, which was kind of a nickname in the 50s and 40s. Also, she was very beautiful, and I think he thought of her as kind of delectable. And... Um, so the first part of the book um, runs from 30, 1937 when they met through 1955 on the, that terrible day in which the plane was bombed. Um, the second half of the book uh, runs from really from 1955 until 1960 and it reads like a memoir uh, of Susan Morgan, uh, the character, but um, Susan Morgan is also my wife's name. Uh, she tells both halves of the story, uh, but it's really me imagining a character named Susan Morgan, imagining her parents' lives because she describes events that took place before she was born. Uh, the period from she's from 1937 until 1943 when she was born she obviously wasn't there for so that part's in the historic novel takes place primarily in vancouver bc where her parents lived and met but they had a very dramatic life that uh she didn't really know about 
because it took place before she was born. They ran off. He was married to somebody else. He was came from a well-to-do family in Vancouver, wanted to get a divorce from his unhappy marriage um, after he'd met Anne. And uh, instead, they eloped, got on in 1939. Stu and Anne got on a train together. He told his wife he was going by himself to South Africa, another Commonwealth com country. She met him. They ran off together and actually got to South Africa just before Hitler invaded Poland. And so they set up a life there. He was an engineer, Stu was. And um, both of the girls, Susan and her older sister, Sherry, were born in South Africa. Um, were, was he divorced? Uh, no. He was divorced after the war when word got back uh, and what had happened. I, it's, we've never been able to find um, a marriage license for Anne and Stu. Um, it doesn't mean there wasn't one, I, w but what I actually think is they got married on shipboard f f from Nova Scotia to South Africa, um, or maybe they didn't and just told everybody they were married. Right, because would it be legal if they had gotten married since it would have no, been would bigamy? Have, it would have absolutely, he would have been a bigamist. And the second half of the novel, but as I say, it, uh, um, I taught a lot of memoir writing as well as fiction writing, reads like a, a memoir because there's a retrospective point of view from the character Susan Morgan talking about what happened. Um, uh, Stu was disowned basically by his well to up, his upper class family. And so when they died, Cuppy and Stu in 1955, um, they were sent, the girls were sent back to live with their maternal grandmother. Um, and the maternal side of the family was um, working class and actually really pretty poor. The grandmother was a Scottish immigrant and um, very, very tight and also with money, but also kind of crazy. And so the girls ended up as wards of the province. Things went very, very badly. And the five years from 1955 till 1960, when Susan escaped, were really pretty Dickensian um, in terms of a childhood. So they went back to live in British Columbia. That's, that's right. At the time, in the section I'll read later, um, Cuppy and Stu um, moved, moved a good deal, I think, because when they came back to North America after the war, they came back once, went, went back to British Columbia, and I think it was just really uncomfortable, as I say. Uh, Stu Morgan's family owned, you know, kind of the, the, one of the fancy clothing stores that so, sold into, you know, society. And I think they were, fa family was fairly well known. Uh, and um, it was uncomfortable to live there. So he was an engineer all around British, all around the Northwest, Washington State and Oregon. And they had just moved to Winnetka. He had finally gotten, you know, a, a job that was going to be permanent. And uh, three or four months later, the plane went down. And at that point, uh, the girls were shipped back to British Columbia, where they'd spent some time in the summers, but had never lived there. Is any of the book in your wife's voice, like any of her actual thoughts, or is it all from your mind, fictionalized? Well, uh, I interviewed her quite extensively. You know, um, Susan survived uh, for two reasons. Um, her old, A, she was incredibly smart. She, you know, the smartest kid for miles around and um, thrived in school. And that's where her attention went. Um, and also because she repressed a great deal of what happened to her. 
So like we went back to her parents' grave site for the first time uh, from the year ap after they died. Um, so I d we did a great deal of interviewing. Uh, one of the other things that made it really, yes, to say it's my sixth no novel, about two years into the project, um, we were sitting in our farmhouse in upstate New York where we spent summers during the years that we were both professors in Miami of Ohio. Susan was the distinguished professor of English. I was the director of creative writings. And we, she woke up one morning and she said, you know, I kept diaries for those five years after my parents died. Remember, we've been, I've been researching the book for two years by that point. I said, really? She said, oh yeah, and you know, I think I know where they are. So we walked up to the attic in this old Victorian. She goes right to the box, opens it up, and there they are, you know. Wow. A girlhood diary from 56, you know, um, through 60, the five That's years great. that she was, a, you know, living in Vancouver. And as we came downstairs, she said, you're not going to use these, are you? I said, are you crazy? <laughs> of course I'm going to use them. And so really for the last two years of writing the book, I was in simultaneous conversation with my wife as I knew her and my wife, a grieving adolescent. Um, wow. So there was, um, and that's in a certain way, the way memoir works, you know, you're in simul as the reader, you're in simultaneous conversation with what's happening on the page and with the narrator's reflection, re retrospective reflection on what it means. It, it said, yeah. In this case, it was mine and Susan as a, you know, was quite a private person in many ways. Many people who've known her for 30 or 40 years knew that her parents had died, but didn't know any of the details. Was, has been asked by friends, well, how could you, you know, share all that, you know? And her position has been as an English professor and direct and a woman studies professor. Well, that's Eric's version of me. That's not me on the page, even though in many ways I, would say that I did my best to be accurate to the historical record. So you were saying that this was uh, the first incident of air piracy. I think you said that to me privately before we came mm -hmm. on. Um, did the gentleman bomb the uh, the plane to kill his mother? Was it just sort of a anger, a really over yes, overblown wanted, anger? Uh, uh, Jack Graham. Um, who was the person who put the bomb on the plane, was a sociopath. He wanted yeah. his mother's money. She owned a restaurant. Um, and he packed her suitcase and uh, put 25 sticks of dynamite and a crude timer in the suitcase. And uh, 39 passengers and, and I think four crew members on the plane, everybody died. Um, at the time, in 1955, there was no law against bombing a commercial plane. It had never happened yet. And in yeah. fact, it was a famous case, the cover picture of, which I'm gonna show your audience now, of Cuppy and Stu, mm -hmm. um, ran in Life Magazine. A couple weeks after they died, um, there was an article that had a picture of everybody who was on that plane. Um, as it happened, um, the plane took off late for reasons that are explained in the book. And um, instead of the plane blowing up over the Rocky Mountains, it was a flight from Denver to Seattle. It, and uh, Graham had plotted that the plane would go down over the Rockies and not be discovered. You know, um, it blew up just outside Stapleton Airfield, which was then the name of the airport in Denver. Yeah. And the wreckage was strewn across a sugar beet field. And as a result, 
um, it was immediately clear that it was a bomb. It, I mean, the, and they even knew which um, luggage compartment it was, the bomb had been in. And the FBI um, solved the case within two weeks. They had them. And it, it made the public reputation of the FBI. There was a book that came out a year and a half later called The FBI Story that with a forward by J. Edgar Hoover. And there was later a movie from that book. And the bombing of Flight 629 was the first incident in, in the movie. And it was the you know, prologue to the novel, to the, to the FBI story. So is he in case. jail now? What's that? Is the bomber still alive? Is he in jail now? What happened oh, to oh, him? Um, they, they, um, this was a, a much earlier day. Um, so he was caught by the end of November. Uh, he was tried and he was um, early in 1956 and he was executed early in 1957. Ah, um, okay. Um, at, at unrepentant. Um, when asked about all the collateral deaths, he said, well, you know, you know, takes your chances, you know, he totally unrepentant about them. And for quite some time, um, the people, he was the largest mass murderer in American history. You know, now that, now that you can buy AK-47s and shoot up schools, um, uh, he's been surpassed, but yeah. for people who know, you know, aficionados of mass murder know this case because, you know, for I think close to 20 years, he was the king, Jack Ram, 23 years old when he did. Wow. So that's, I suppose, why the subtitle is a love story because it has so much to do with their early lives and uh, all the sort of intrigue that went into their lives. Yes. Um, well, it's a little bit of a, a doubled meaning. I mean, the bombing of Flight 629, well, that's obviously just the fact. A love story, because, yeah, it's Cuppy and Stu's love story. The, the um, uh, and then also there's a certain way in which um, the act of the two of us, my, me interviewing my wife and I am now the keeper of her memories in a way because she's, con you know, continues to deal with some of this by repression. Sure. You know, it's, it was um, a certain way kind of a love story between two, us, two of us working on it. But yes, it's really Cuppy and Stu's love story. They were incredibly happy um, and um, despite being very different. She, he was, you know, 13 years older. She, you know, uh, much more educated. And as far as my wife could tell, you know, just incredibly in love and, and demonstrably so in a way that was uncommon. Very interesting. So why was um, your unique narration compared to Alice Munro? Well, that was um, a very happy moment for me because, you know, Alice Munro is kind of the writer's writer. And, you know, and Alice Munro's stories are, you know, often, you know, they take place in more than one time frame and there's kind of, a, and they're filtered. And so, the reason that a former editor of mine, I, I, I did a lot of writing f when I was younger for women's magazines. You know, I, back at one point I was on the Today Show as, as the guy who wrote for all the major women's uh, magazines. And it was Ann Smith who was the fiction editor and then the editor of Red Book and McCall's who s said that. It's really because the way the story is told, it's a fictional character, but in some ways similar to my wife, imagining, so I'm imagining a character named Susan Morgan, and yeah. the character Susan Morgan is imagining her parents' lives before she was alive. And this was I how I dealt with the challenge of telling 
a historical novel, you know, set in Vancouver in, in the 30s and in South Africa where the girls were born in the first part and then the second part narrating, having it sound like a memoir and linking the two. And after thinking of ways to do that, what I hit upon was the character Susan Morgan tells her parents' story in the first person. So it's not the first time you've sort of written from a, a point of view of someone that is definitely different from you. You've, you've written about such disparate characters and cultures. How do you research and put yourself in the mindset of, you know, say the, the gay adolescent that you wrote about in the Midwest or the, the race relations issues? Right. Well, um, I've been both a novelist and, and a journalist, and so I've tended ever since my first novel to do kind of life research where I would go to, you know, once I knew my story, I would go to places where it happened and actually imagine myself going through those paces. Um, you know, going to a farm in Western Kansas in my first novel, you know, High in the Energy Bridge where you know, a boy from the, from Brooklyn learns he has a grandfather that he didn't know about, you know, who was a Midwesterner and goes to look at it. Um, the gay adolescence is um, in Child of My Right Hand uh, was inspired by my gay son. Um, so um, that's probably the one that took the, the least of a leap since um, I had watched um, that in some ways. Uh, in Twelfth and Race, which was, you know, if you're an American novelist and you haven't thought about race or written about race, then, which is a hard thing to write about, um, you know, then you miss the great American subject, it's, it seems to me. In that, in, in that novel, it's about a mixed race couple trying to raise a child. Um, in a city exploding with racial tension um, and based upon riots that had taken place in, in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, in 2001. Wow. And so, um, you know, and again, at that point, I, um, with a student, an African-American student of mine, with uh, two of us were quite close friends and are to this day, you know, you, I went to, you know, pretty much to all black dance clubs, you know, uh -huh. with, with my friend, uh, imagining what it was like to be there in that, in that, in that world. Wow. So you do, as you said, you directed the creative writing pro program at Miami University and you founded the low res MFA program there. Do you still teach? And, um, I understand you're also a book doctor. What is that all about? Well, I still teach. So you are a doctor. <laughs> I, am, I am a doctor. And I finished pre-med as an undergraduate at Yale. So I was supposed to be a doctor. I have two older brothers who are lawyers. And my parents were hoping for the Jewish trifecta. Uh, <laughs> but when I, I really wanted to be a writer. Um, so um, I don't teach at Miami any, any longer. And I you know, stopped running the, the low res MFA uh, at the end of 2018. I do teach um, uh, every summer, although not this one, at, uh, in Iowa City at the Iowa, Semi Iowa City Summer Writers Festival. Yeah. And uh, have done that and enjoyed doing that. I have some good friends who teach there as well. And it's a way for us to, to stay in touch. And also, I like teaching. I, I've, you know, many of my, I'm happy to say, quite a number of my former students, you know, have gone on to make careers as writers. Uh, and I had worked with them when, when they were, you know, much younger. The book doctoring, you know, is, is you know, every year a, a couple of former students or people have heard about my work in that way uh, who've, finished a, a book but they a manuscript but they know that it's not right yet uh will you know hire me to edit it or sort of give them my impressions of what might need to be done um 
you know, a close reading and a series of, of notes for how to improve it. So it's really pretty much like being a developmental editor. Yeah, that's right. You know, I've okay. worked with some, with some people while they were writing a book, uh, but doctoring the book is sort of what I think of as, you know, diagnosing what's wrong with it uh, or, or what, what might ail it. And, yeah. and uh, I've done this long enough reading people's work that um, I think it developed a certain skill for diagnosing the problem. And I'm also gotten, a, you know, older than I was and slightly crankier. And so I'm, I'm really quite straightforward. You know, there's no point uh, in telling somebody who's written a book and knows that it's not quite right and soft soaping what needs to be done. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, nobody wants to pay and just have uh, their their issues sort of wiped over and, and not addressed. Right. Although what was interesting is my first editor told me that I was one of the few people who had ever hired him who actually went back and made the corrections. Oh, and I was really? like, why would I go through all the trouble of hiring you if I wasn't going to make the corrections? He said, most people don't. They just get so upset with the, the corrections, they never go back to it. Right. Well, you know, it's um, I've run a lot of workshops. And, you know, uh, people getting their egos out of the way is really hard because, you know, they've worked so hard on, on what they're doing that to be able to hear what people are saying takes, a, you know, a certain kind of personality, you know, so yeah. being edited isn't all that easy. You have to trust the person you, who's you're working with. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I used to kid my, my, I have a friend who does my editing at, or does my beta reading. And I, I threatened to kill her entire family because she wanted to move a comma. And yet she wants to edit for me again. I think you're very brave. Right. <laughs> I don't really do that. <laughs> right. I, 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 uh, I'll do what you say, but I'd have to kill you afterwards. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So um, I have one last question that I'd love you to read. Um, I've noticed that, uh, well, I'm always curious about book marketing, and I noticed that Cuppy and Stew is available digitally, and I was wondering what the thinking was behind that. Well, the thinking was behind that, um, I think, was unfortunate. Basically, the uh, IFSF, uh, a small, and really, they make very handsome books, the, um, the publisher uh, likes books and just has never uh, made it of any of his titles available digitally. I think uh -huh. that it, that's a romantic notion and, and probably be better if it was available digitally because I get lots of requests, but at this point it's not. I see. Okay. Well, would you like to read a few pages for Yes, I'd be, for I'd be very happy to. I, um, and as a mentioned the book is sort of in two parts um the, the part that one could think of as historical novel and the part that feels like a memoir and uh i'm reading the very short section uh that begins that part uh, chapter 16 can you hear me and all you need to know is that susan morgan is telling it and sherry's her older sister Sherry and I knew nothing. It was 1955 and we knew nothing. We'd been living in Winnetka for four months. Daddy had been working at his new engineering firm for those same four months. On the night of November 1st, which I'd later learned was known as the Day of the Dead and think, of course it is, Sherry and I were sleeping when the phone rang or maybe a policeman came to our door. Or maybe there were a series of phone calls, each one more upsetting than the last. I don't remember much from those early days, but I remember this. They woke up Granny, that stupid, ignorant cow, with her twinkly blue eyes and snowy hair, and told her she'd lost her daughter. And Granny, whom the world called Annie, and whom we, especially Sherry, would later refer to as that crazy old bitch, had aroused her grandchildren, whom she'd always half feared, much as she feared her son-in-law, and say, your mum and dad's plane crashed, 
your orphans now. Then she began to cry and pulled us into her pillowy bosom. I remember Granny's face and Sherry's too, their liquid open mouths, the pure animal shock of it. Later, in our room, Sherry and I held each other and cried. I can see my short blonde hair and Sherry's red curls intermixed, our arms wrapped around each other, a still life of grief and loss. We spent the night in one bed, unwilling to let go. I doubt we slept much. I don't think we said much either, but towards morning, Sherry whispered, Sue, I'll take care of you, and I drifted off. Sherry and I awoke to the taste of tears. One glance at Sherry's swollen eyes and it all came back. Mom and Daddy died. I hugged her and started to cry, and then Sherry was crying too. I don't know how we stopped. That afternoon, our Winnetka neighbors, most of whom we hadn't seen before, arrived with casseroles to feed our grief. Several engineers who said they worked with my father came with their wives. Mr. Myers, the head of Daddy's engineering firm, brought his minister. We didn't know one. Mr. Myers' minister had rosy cheeks and bushy eyebrows. He wrangled us into a quiet corner of the living room. My thoughts were already circling on one of the obsessive tracks it would follow for years. Mom, Daddy, can you hear me? Granny had insisted we wore our best clothes. The minister took our hands. Girls, I want you to know how sorry I am for your loss. I glanced at Sherry, her red hair and freckles. I know this is a terrible time, girls. Believe me, I know. But I also want you to understand that your parents, his eyebrows crawled up his forehead, are in a better place. They're happy because they're in heaven. He squeezed my hand, and I suppose Sherry's too. I know it's hard, but I want you to be happy for your parents because they're happy. What a stupid religion, I thought. They're not happy. How could he say they're happy? We slipped away from the minister's creepy eyebrows. He wouldn't be the last adult to feed us a warmed-over version of this was God's will. Without our parents to protect us, we'd entered an adult world of lies. No wonder our parents hadn't taken us to church. I knew they weren't in a better place because heaven was crap. They were in pieces on the ground somewhere, all bloody and chopped up. Sherry and I hid in the kitchen where there were cakes and piles of cookies, which they expected us to eat. I couldn't imagine picking up even one. Three days later, someone drove us to the lawyer's office to endure the reading of the will. My memory zooms in and out. Some moments sparkle like snow on a bright morning. Others remain dark, as if someone is toggling a switch. I see Mr. Browning's desk with a gold pen and pencil on one end, framed photos on the other. Mr. Browning's hair is center parted. He wears a three-piece suit and tie. His hair, clothes, and eyes are uniformly brown. But that might be a trick of memory. Sixty years later, all I'm really certain of is his name, Mr. Browning, and that he was a nice man, certainly dead by now. Sherry, Granny, and I sit across from him. The lawyer's lips move. His words flutter forward, but resist interpretation. Something about flight insurance, trustee. In the event, it is our wish that our children not be placed with their maternal grandmother and Kerr. I understand little past the troubled look on Granny's face. Then the room brightens and Mr. Browning reads, To the children of my first marriage, Frederick and Judith, whom I have supported until now, I leave nothing. I specifically disinherit them. Instead, to my daughters, Sharon Ann and Susan Jennifer, I leave the entirety. The knowledge that Daddy had other children and presumably another wife registers, then explodes. Mr. Browning 
resume speech without sound, and the scene slips away like all the houses we lived in, like our happy days across the Pacific Northwest and in South Africa, where I was born, like the family we once were. Mom, Daddy, can you hear me? Wow. Very powerful. I'll take wow as good. Yeah, very good. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. So this is available through Amazon. Is it available anywhere else? Yes, it's available um, from spdbooks.org, which is the nonprofit distributor that distributes most of the literary presses and university press books in the country. So it's okay. spdbooks.org and through Amazon. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you for spending time with me today. It's been wonderful. I wish you best of luck with your work and please stay safe. Thank you, Dawn. You too. It's been a thank pleasure you. to be here. Thank you.